Hi, good morning. It's Jim from the Mavstar Observatory. Uh, today we're going to just talk about why the Mavstar Observatory is a pioneer in its own right uh, with some of the things that we monitor here. Uh, before we do, as always, big thanks to those that you know are supporting us with a little bit of um, funding um, and even more so during the time that we're in. Uh, trust me, I was talking about it the other day about charities and other um, organisations that rely on you know, donations to keep going are massively suffering right now. And, you know, with the observatory, um, you know, it couldn't be at a worse time really for us here. Um, but nevertheless, you know, we still try and strive uh, to move forward. Uh, we really did hit the ground running this year with the muon detectors going out into the field. And not only am I going to be uh, in this video talking about the amount of muons that we've got, uh, we're going to look at CO2, oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere, background radiation, and you know we're going to talk about the magnetosphere and its uh, strength and condition. But really, science in general is about answering questions using the scientific model, which is you know usually by uh, examining specifics to find out the reality of whether something is as we expect it to be or not and the only way you can do that is by measurement so science really is measurement and the reason why we're measuring things is because we want to find out the answer it's not always the easiest um, thing to do trust me and sometimes as i've discussed before requires a lot of money to answer certain questions i mean if we just use um, the european space agency uh, and their mission swarm to monitor the earth's magnetic fields and intensities uh, that that mission alone cost uh, millions of pounds to put those satellites those three satellites up into space to to find out the answers to that question so sometimes you know you can ask a question um, but it's very difficult to get the answer simply because you haven't got the funding or the means to do so so I want to start off by answering the question that probably some of you guys are wondering. How many muons um, are entering our atmosphere and coming down to our detectors on the hourly basis per square metre? And the answer is to that, simply because we've got the equipment that measures it, is 533 muons per hour per square metre. That's a moderate amount um, it probably would be a higher amount if we compared it with 20 years ago because there's obviously more muons coming through our upper atmosphere now due to around a 20% drop in the uh, magnetosphere shield that we have. So they are um, you know, on the increase and we've got the equipment now in place monitoring that increase. Now we'll say sometimes it fluctuates between 500 and 600 uh, muons per hour per square meter so you know we, we could say that if, if it's at 533 uh, which was the reading today you know then it's probably moderate it's not high at the highest in the 600s it's not at its lowest in the low 500s it's moderate or uh, low to moderate um, you know it's really easy to take uh, into consideration uh, you know all these things and take them for granted you know when we get in the car usually we turn the key and the engine starts and you know we probably don't pay any attention uh, attention to all the instruments that we've got in the car and some cars don't even have these instruments anymore they don't have or most cars don't, these days don't have oil pressure gauges um, simply because you know in general if the car's in good condition it's been serviced it doesn't need uh, you don't need to know what the oil pressure is um, only in some circumstances would you need to know that perhaps in a sports car uh, or if you was racing then those things would probably be important to you but you know in general we take all these things for granted here at the math star observatory we we don't just monitor muons or the magnetosphere strength or the position of the magnetic poles we we've got like a console what we can monitor a lot of things on it's like i can tell you today that the co2 in parts per million is at 433 parts per million and um you know this is a slight increase 
perhaps on around 12 months ago. So, you know, the CO2 is slightly increasing, um, you know, because even if you go on what, um, you know, these organisations publish, you know, they say it's around uh, 408 to 410 parts per million, you know, here in the UK. And, and this does fluctuate on a daily basis, uh, the parts per million. It would be different tomorrow, trust me. Um, and that is to do with, you know, the jet streams uh, and the direction of the wind and where it's blowing that wind from. So if it's coming over, you know, continents uh, which are heavily industrial, uh, then you can expect those parts per million to increase. But in general, what we're interested in is the reservoir of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that is probably around about, you know, what we get on an average is probably around about 420 parts per million. Um, I also did a oxygen um, test on the amount of oxygen in our reservoir. That's at 20.94% usually. It's 21%, so there's plenty of oxygen in our atmosphere right now. Uh, we're not losing any. Uh, you know, when you think about it, 20% of our atmosphere is oxygen. That's a huge, huge reservoir. And the only reason why we know uh, it is at 20.94% is because we've got the Luminox sensor, which is state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, that measures oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere and we've also got a plunge ball on there which when we pump that we prime the air straight to the sensor uh, from outside in the atmosphere and it gives us an accurate reading um, at that very second so you know we the the reason why we know we've got 533 muons per square meter sorry per hour is because We've got, again, state-of-the-art silicon photo multipliers. This is, there, there is nothing newer than that. We use the largest silicon photo multiplier um, to hand uh, at this point in time. There is nothing else there that does the job as good as that. So we are very much using the best of the equipment that we can get our hands on. I also did a standard background radiation test and we're at 0 0.017 microsievets, which is very low. If it was at 50 microsievets, then we could have probably cause for concern, but we don't uh, at this present time. You can also use uh, Geiger counters, by the way, to detect not just um, you know gamma, beta, and uh, alpha particles, but it's also a good indication of what's going on in the upper atmosphere, because if we're getting more collisions in our upper atmosphere with cosmic rays, then we're also going to be getting more of gamma, beta and alpha particles and an ordinary Geiger counter can test for those. Whereas our muon detectors are specifically searching for muons. The only other thing that will um, throw up uh, errors in the results that we collect with the muon detector is if it does detect, uh, if it does encounter gamma rays or photons of light. Those are the only other two things that will uh, give us a false reading, but we can uh, we can narrow down those uh, uncertainties by simply doing a background radiation check with a Geiger counter and making sure that no sunlight gets into the actual uh, cinculate uh, crystal, which is above the silicon photo multiplier. Um, and the only other one that I can tell you uh, today is about the magnetosphere strength. Now, it depends on where you are because we've got um, different uh, strengths at different regions of our Earth. Like if you're in Russia, it's going to be close to uh, 58 microteslas. If you're in Canada, it's going to be more around 57 microteslas. If you're in the South Atlantic anomaly, it's, you're probably talking around about 25 microteslas. And the reason why we want to put one of our muon detectors in there is to see if there is a great increase in the actual rate of muons uh, as a result of being in a low protected area with regards to the magnetosphere strength. Now, we know because the International uh, Space Station does pass over that region of the Earth and is more vulnerable as it does so because, you know, our magnetosphere extends well above the Earth's surface out into space. And, um, you know, anything within that magnetosphere um, region is protected but when it goes through that weakest part of the earth 
um, like in the South Atlantic anomaly, then there is more risks at that point in time for the space station and any other satellites for that reason. And, uh, you know, that's why, in general, they try and avoid flights over these regions with uh, spacecraft. So, yeah, you know, if we was looking at a console, we could see today a lot of green lights. You know, the, there isn't uh, a great amount of um, CO2 that would cause any concern. In fact, we could increase it by another 500 parts per million. We could rank it up to about 1,000 parts per million. The only thing that would f thrive on that um, increase would be all the biodiversity of the planet across the range, even ourselves. And why is that? Because plants benefit from CO2. If you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, you have uh, thriving vegetation on this planet. You know, when you start to drop it back to 250 parts per million, you shut down, you know, the biodiversity on this planet. And that also includes ourselves. If we shut down the vegetation, we are also down the line shutting down ourselves at that point. So, you know, we're well in the green with the CO2. Uh, muons are slightly up, and that means other radiation as well is slightly on the increase. Uh, you know, this is something we want to keep a monitor on because, you know, if that goes up, then cancer rates go up, cardiac arrhythmosis is affected more, and in general, across the biodiversity on this planet, you know, it's not a good thing. Um, the magnetosphere strength is something else worth keeping an eye on. Uh, in the different regions that we are monitoring now, we're in Canada. Uh, shortly, hopefully, you know, customs will release our magnetometer, and uh, Kendall can get hold of that, and we can get that set up and running, and we can start taking some readings there because we know Canada's magnetosphere is dropping off, and you know we're always going to keep trying, you know, to get a magnetometer into Russia because we know the magnetic North Pole at the moment. The dipole is stuck in between Canada and Russia. It is moving towards Russia, and we know why that is, because in the higher intensities is where generally the magnetic dipoles are, and the reason why it's left Canada is because it no longer holds enough field strength in that region to keep the magnetic pole there. And as a result of um, that decreasing in Canada and increasing in Russia, you know, the pole is migrating towards Russia and will be there in the foreseeable future not too distant future either guys so yeah you know we can answer these questions because we've got generally the equipment to monitor them we know where the magnetic north pole is we know what the magnetic field strengths are you know we know what the co2 is we know what the oxygen readings are we know what the background radiation is and a lot of other things as well if you go on the website we cover a lot of other things if you're interested in Schumann frequency on a daily basis it's updated two three times a day uh, we've got magnetometer data from uh, other uh, observatories as well as our own and um, you know you can find out uh, the latest on the trimag data uh, if you're interested by just going onto that website but more importantly there's a lot of anomalies that we cover like earthquakes uh, volcanic eruptions and as you know another thing that would draw your attention um, to is the depleting erupting volcanoes at this time now this could be part of you know the core changing and the poles reversing you know it could also be you know uh, a bad sign of a core solidifying and slowing down and this is very much likely what happened on Mars uh, thousands of years ago when the magnetosphere collapsed and didn't regain. As a result of that, it lost its atmosphere and then in turn the water on its planet. It's left it looking like a planet that was probably never inhabited with any species of life, but maybe it did have, we just haven't found it. And to what level that life was at, you know, uh, we're going to probably find out in the future. Uh, when we do more explorations on Mars, but uh, at the moment, you know, we haven't found any life on there, not even microscopic. We did know it had water. Uh, it still has very small ice caps, um, and it hasn't. Uh, it, it's, it, it does um, appear occasionally to have a very small atmosphere. So, you know, we know at the moment that if 
our core is slowing down in our, on our planet, then at some point, you know, we could expect to uh, look like Mars. Uh, how long it would take for that to happen could be a thousand years, could be tens of thousands of years. But, you know, the magnetosphere is of great importance. And, uh, you know, we monitor that here at the observatory. So, you know, I just wanted to say, guys, you know, that's why our observatory is important. Because these things that we've talked about today and the levels of these, um, you know, anomalies that we look at and the readings that we get isn't something that's published um, anywhere else. Or if it is, you have to look probably at 10 different websites to get the information. You know, we deliver it all here in one place as well as a lot of other things on the website, you know. And we try and bring people's attention to the fact that we are in a very unique and dynamic time right now. Uh, Our world is in a a great movement of change. And, you know, we shouldn't take that for granted. We can easily continue eating our bacon sandwiches and drinking our coffees in the morning and going about our business as usual. But, you know, these big changes which are slowly moving... Um, to new dynamics you know will eventually come back to us at our breakfast table and you know we realize that when the bacon isn't there or the tea isn't there or the coffee isn't there and you know at that point it's generally too late you know this subject that we cover is probably only known to about one percent of the entire earth's human beings right now so out of seven billion people only one percent or less know that the earth is going through a magnetic reversal and this is a rare event last time it completed a reversal was 780,000 years ago so it's a big deal for us all and it could also be massively life changing as well so you know I, I just ask you know that you keep supporting us and we'll keep delivering the information on these topics and if you want to do that you can join us on Patreon or you can make a one-off donation on PayPal, and the links are down there in the description, guys. You know, that's it for today. Um, You know, it's not easy answering the questions sometimes. You know, it requires more than uh, just a little bit of, uh, you know, logical thinking. You know, it requires the standard scientific test, and that generally Uh, means you've got to get equipment to measure and monitor things in order to get the answers that's what we do so we don't just talk we're more proactive than that we actually put it into action get the gear out there in the in the field and get the readings back and then process that data for you guys to know the answers to those questions so in simple terms you know that's what we do here at the observatory and that's why you know we're probably pioneering in our own little field So there's a link there if you want to support us and the only other thing to say is you have an amazing day and I'll catch up with you again at some point in the week. As always, bye for now.